have a wonderful session today on new nationalisms in uh, new media, or maybe not so new media. Uh, so our first presenters will be Arthur Deppner and Simon Goebel from uh, the uh, Tour and Tour uh, NGO in Augsburg. Then I will give the floor to um, Jan Kaifos from uh, the University of Silesia in Katowice. Uh, then uh, Robert Pyro uh, from um, Oxford University. And last but not, not least, Maria Sabina Draga Alexandru from uh, Bucharest University. I will try to keep the time limit to 15 minutes, uh, and I've already used uh, at least one. Uh, I will try to indicate then uh, when there's three, limits, uh, three, three minutes left, and um, then I will tell you to wrap up eventually. Um, so um, without further ado, let's start with the first presentation. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Um, hello, everyone. We'd like to thank the organizing team for the arranging of this conference and for the invitation. It's a pleasure for us to speak here. Um, the subject um, is alarming in fact. It seems as if so much people haven't learned anything out of history. Uh, as we are from Germany, uh, the election yesterday um, yeah, was quite horrible for us as a new right-wing party, the so-called alternative for Germany, um, was elected into the parliament and moved into the parliament. Um, we both want to give you a short insight We both want to give you a short insight in our research about the so-called Every Second Counts campaign, leaded by satirical late-night shows all over Europe and beyond. Uh, and please give us a short hand sign if you have seen at least one of those videos. So, okay, it's, it is not so well known under uh, scientists. Um, thank you. Uh, the campaign Every Second Counts. Uh, the campaign Every Second Counts focuses the new nationalism of, um, and I have to say the name Donald Trump, or maybe I uh, will uh, <laughs> say also uh, the mentioned um, Twitter president, um, but I, I tried to do this, but maybe, well, it's an ironic context, and so maybe I can uh, use it for the uh, lecture as well. <laughs> Um, you all know his um, slogan, Make America Great Again. Uh, you all know his uh, baseball caps, those road, uh, red baseball caps, um, won by Trump himself and his supporters. Uh, being great is not reprehensible, um, as it doesn't mean really, it doesn't mean anything. But it is reprehensible, claiming to be first in the sense of a world competition between nation states. This is what Trump is targeting on, and as, it, as he expressed at his Inauguration, inauguration speech in Washington, he said, from this day forward, um, it's going to be only America first, and he made a dramatic pause and uh, repeated, America first. The nas nationalistic motivation of the Twitter president is obvious. The absurdity and imminence of the Twitter president's statement was taken by the Dutch late night show Sonntag mit Lubach, which means Sunday with Lubach, to create a satire video. Uh, Arjen Lubach, the moderator, announced the video saying that they decided to introduce our tiny country to him in a way that will probably appeal to him the most. Accordingly, the speaker of the video imitates the sound of Trump's voice as well as linguistic peculiarities like collocations. Um, the video purports being an official application video from the government of the Netherlands. The first image shows uh, one of the first images show dreamlike countryside containing a cliche sitting or setting of the Netherlands with water, windmills, and a flat landscape. It reminds the viewer of a commercial for tourists. The speaker advertises that this will be a great video. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. This is what I meant by linguistic peculiarities. The simple language and uh, superlatives where Fort Trump isn't famous. After a short part of about 15 seconds, that gets uh, Dutch history, the video advocates for the Dutch language, which they call the best language in Europe, by opposing it explicitly from other languages, um, like the Danish, they call it total disaster, and the German language, they call it, it's a fake language. Uh, so other nations are supposed, or supposed national characteristics get worsened. 
but showplaces, people, and circumstances in the context of the Netherlands are used to construct links to Trump's outrageous but successful behavior. For instance, the video promotes a pony park at which you can ride ponies, and furthermore, you can date them, you can grab them by the pony. It's fantastic, a reference to Trump's sexist and misogynic <coughs> comments. The production of a far-fetched proximity between the real and horrendous context of Donald Trump and the harmless context of show places creates amusement and a satirical and ironic effect. In the end, the video applies for being second. We totally, uh, quote, we totally understand it's going to be America first, but can we just say the Netherlands second? Is that okay? End of quote. It sounds like a subservient gesture. In claiming for being second, the video deconstructs the nationalistic mistake, assuming that every human being is tending to seek for the best and not just for the second best of its country. But at the same time, the video reproduces a thinking in national categories by affronting the Spaniards, the Danish, the Germans, and the Mexicans. It doesn't manage to deconstruct national stereotypes and rather iterates them. So this is uh, contradictory. After all, the German um, late-night show Neo Magazin Royale with moderator Jan Böhmermann picked up the idea of Sonntag mit Lubach and initialized a national context on being second by producing similar videos. Many late-night shows in Europe and worldwide, but also social media player, answered the call. The contributions are collected on the website called everysecondcounts.eu. <clears throat> We ask ourselves, is this a national or even nationalistic undertaking, or do the videos counter national and nationalistic rhetoric and subversive satire? I will give you a few examples. The following examples are a selection out of our extensive data that we think, think is relevant to make our point. In the German video, while images of Hitler are shown, they say, Germany has a great history. We actually, it's true, have the best history in the world. Great politicians, great leaders, so smart, great hair, great suit. Look at his suit. He made Germany great again. The media totally loved him, wrote only nice things about him. Great guy, total winner. His book, a bestseller. It's true. Steve Bannon absolutely loves him. Humor gets created by contrasting and accepted with an unexpected meaning. Putting Hitler in a positive light, especially in completely negligible contexts like great hair, great suit, may result in amusement. But in respect to the national self-description, this example is not critical at all. This is not self-deprecating as it may be intended to be. First, because virtually everyone knows that Hitler had it, uh, he did the most appalling barbarism in history, and second, because virtually everyone distances, distances oneself from the Nazi regime. So this is not relevant for a current construction of a national self-representation. The video implicitly sweeps the nationalistic parties and movements, like the so-called alternative for Germany, um, under the carpet of a current self-representation. In the video from a Portuguese late night show, they say, we were born in 1143, meaning that we are one of the oldest nations in the world. It's amazing how old we are. We should be dead in a while. It's true. <laughs> the supposed proudness of being an old nation, with all its nationalistic implications of tradition, grown culture, and outliving national identity, is made inanely by stating that the old-aged Portugal will die meaning that it is precisely not outliving. This is an example for deconstruction of a nationalistic narrative. The contribution from Czech Republic is produced by a video producer who has a channel on YouTube called stream.cz international, like the two contributions from Poland, by the way. There are two contributions which uh, are um, different. But um, I won't focus this in this lecture. So. Um, beneath the professionally um, produced videos made by a whole TV team from late night satire shows, there are also other ways of production. Maybe this makes a difference. The video from stream.cz uh, international starts with non-satirical racist statements. They call Germany just a bunch of immigrants and show this image while saying to Swiss this, this image um, uh, while saying to uh, referring to Switzerland even more immigrants. After all, this is their national soccer team. 
the arrows pointing on black players exclude them as non-Swiss, which is of course wrong as they all have a Swiss nationality unless they couldn't play in the national uh, soccer team. It shows the strong ties between nationalism and racism. Um, and um, they construct the deviation of normality um, that Swiss are also black, and this, this is a normality. Um, yeah. Okay, um, next example from Serbia. The contribution from Serbia offends Albania by saying, just like you, we also have problems with Mexicans. We call them Albanians, nasty people. This refers to ongoing tensions between Serbia and Albania and is not set in, a, in an ironic context. So this is what we looked at. Is, uh, this what, uh, is, uh, is it set in an ironic context or in a satirical context or not? Um, and uh, is it self-deprecating or not? And the last example, the video, um, it's a non-European video made by Joe Tube from Egypt. And this is, in my opinion, one of the best videos referring to the deconstruction of national nationalities. For instance, the speaker in the video starts saying with proudness in his voice, we have a 7,000 year civilization and we have then the voice sounds insecure. It says uh, a 7,000 year civilization uh, and a uh, 7,000 year civilization. So there's nothing more than that, obviously. The producer, producer of the video uh, makes fun of the popular way of self-representation, emphasizing the national history. Instead, they tell us how meaningless those narratives um, are. Okay, due to our short time frame, those few examples have to suffice to make our point and Arthur will complete. And you have three and a half minutes. Pardon? <laughs> three minutes? Okay. Three and a half. Okay. okay. Um, Is there satisfaction in your voice? I only have three <laughs> minutes. Okay. From a cultural anthropology perspective, nationalism, and its forms of expressions in the media are of great interest. And uh, Dr. Goebel and I also uh, worked, uh, wrote a paper about the use of metaphors in speeches in the German parliament during the so-called refugee crisis, um, given there and referring to this crisis uh, with several metaphors. Um, national thinking contains, and I think we all know this, but uh, we cannot emphasize this enough, a strict separation of identities, us and them. The frontiers of a nation in this sense include cultural, ethnic, religious, linguistic and other categories that are used to charge the we with spe specific qualities. In everyday life, notions and practices differentiating people amongst those categories are to be found in various contexts such as jokes, small talk, getting to know someone, diagnosing of the appearance, behavior, or names of people, and so on. The media function as a, distribu a distributor of such knowledge and um, <clears throat> is a distributor of such knowledge and create links between a common consciousness and individual aware awareness. At the same time, the people who produce media are for themselves part of everyday life, and politicians and media makers, for instance, themselves consume media in their occup occupational time and private life as well. The power of nationalistic imaginations and images of identities lies in their potential to create shared beliefs about what and who we are, how we behave, and how we lead our lives, what we hold dear and whom we dislike, etc. They create a normality which helps reducing the complexity of human interaction if we, um, for instance, um, think like Levinas that the other is a mysterious one for everyone. A fundamental function of stereotypes. For most people, they are part of their social socialization one way or the other, along with the respective narratives, symbols, celebrations, rituals, etc. Of course, there are a lot of people who are aware of this complexity of social, um, of meeting, of, uh, of human interaction. Um, but this also may count for some of the video makers we discussed. But does this consciousness suffice to face the complexity even more so in an entertaining context? We argue that the satiric vi videos would simply not have their intended effect 
That is, they would not work if it wasn't for the shared understanding of the national or nationalistic notions and knowledge within the audience watching those videos. And as Mr. Uh, Professor Erickson just said, there he, he uh, sees a lack of interest in understanding things um, arising from these shortened messages or uh, in information bits. And perhaps uh, entertaining messages, not only short messages, but entertaining messages also can have this uh, e effect that they like uh, um, um, create a certain kind of emotional understanding that everyone can easily uh, live up to. Satire as such is only possible due to the ability of, to distance oneself from such, let's call them, subjectivizing dispositives. So on the one hand, the general ability to emancipate oneself is key to satire being possible at all. On the other hand, however, satire also functions as a catalyst for em emancipatory movements. So it's intertwined very, very interestingly. By pointing out the madness and stupidity of nationalistic stereotypes, satire lifts some of the weight people might feel when they are being confronted with them. At the same time, satire tries not to lose sight of the seriousness of these um, subjects, of these um, themes. Nonetheless, the satirical examination of nationalism reproduces the respective power structures, images, and imagination. The question at hand is whether the media and its actions, like the making of such videos, um, should be seen as part of a progressive and subversive development, or rather, as a part of a delighting and relieving entertainment industry that unwillingly slides pieces of conservative power structures back through the, through the back door, back in through the back door. From our point of view, the answer cannot be easily given. However, it is very important to be aware of the double aspect of such projects and media content. Only by not overseeing their ambiguity can one fully understand the role they play in an established normality. And it is only from this viewpoint that one is able to keep the distance needed for pr proceeding further on the path of emancipation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And let's immediately move to the next presentation. So Jan Kajkos, please. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for the possibility to speak. I will um, just read my, uh, uh, my um, contribution uh, to uh, so that I can finish in 15 minutes. I'd like to answer the question, what conditions shape the contemporary social production and reproduction of nationalisms compared to the era of modernity? We can define contemporary nationalisms as a, a comparatively new phenomenon due to different criteria. In the eastern part of the European Union, we can, for example, observe that territorial disputes, borders, and borderlands are not anymore an important issue within local nationalisms. In the central and eastern Europe, 70 years after the end of the Second World War, trauma caused by the closest neighbors and neighbor states is not anymore so important for the development uh, and maintenance of national identifications as it used to be. The hostile other doesn't seem to be identified anymore with a neighbor state. The so-called migration crisis revealed that in the eyes of Central and Eastern European, the hostile other is predominantly placed outside of Europe. If contemporary Polish or Czech nationalists are worried about German ethnicity endangered through Muslim migrants, we face a new phenomenon. It, it could be paradoxically regarded a symptom of some kind of so solidarity with imagined ordinary Germans, or even a symptom of conceptual integration with imagined ethnic nations of the Western Europe. In Central and Eastern European countries, the hostile other is identified more with individuals among us. The hostile other is here predominantly recognized as a non-ethnic European. In Poland, we can beside that observe another interesting shift. National belonging starts to be defined through one's political convictions. We doesn't, either, who doesn't identify himself with nationalist policies can be regarded leftist, and a leftist cannot be a real Pole. 
we can find these concepts in social media networks dominated by the issue of national identity. This is something relatively new. Nevertheless, I would like to present another attempt. I'd like to follow the ways and circumstances of the reproduction of contemporary nationalisms. I'd like to examine the claim new nationalisms are folklorized in such a way that their production is to a large extent spontaneous, anonymous, and highly aestheticized. First, let me answer the question, what does it mean if we speak about folklorization of contemporary nationalisms? The notion of folklore doesn't relate only to oral texts of the pre-modern plebeian culture. If we draw on Piotr Bo uh, Grigorievich Bogatyrev and Roman Jakobson, two structuralist scholars, every society, including modern and postmodern societies, has its folklore. Bogatyrev and Jakobson defined in 1920s folklore as a poetical text aimed at la langue. This means that folklore texts have systemic character in that sense that they repeat the same motives and the same tacit knowledge in the form of shared assumptions and presuppositions. The same motive can be broadly reproduced in different genres and different text mutations. This way, folklore texts reproduce the same semantic structures within a larger or smaller communicative society. Contemporary folklore texts are not necessarily oral. They can be written. If we draw on Walter Ong, even iconized texts like computer memes um, can have under some aspects the same or similar features as, as oral texts. They can be, for example, quite ephemeral in perception. In the frame of social media, people mostly deal only with up-to-date posts which affect their attention. Folklore texts are popular within a larger or smaller communicative society. They must be comprehensible and attractive in that sense that they meet current social needs. Only under this condition they are passed on to other recipients and from them to other ones. They must have the potential to be shared and to spread within the communication network. Folklore texts replicate themselves themselves in many mutations which, which continually adapt to changing social and political circumstances. Due to Bogatyrev and Jakobson, folklore genres like rumors, hoaxes, contemporary myths or conspiration theories fulfill a poetical function. They are aestheticized. They entertain, amaze, frighten, they make people laugh. Folklore texts can arouse intense feelings among its bearers. Folklore creation is always a sphere of spontaneous social prosumption, it means production then in the same way uh, consumption, as well as a sphere of so-called infotainment, entertainment through information. Folklore works as an instrument of reproducing shared beliefs, value systems, stereotypes, conceptual scenarios, expectations or attitudes towards different phenomena. As stated by Antonio Gramsci, Folklore is the essential mean of ideology reproduction. It is responsible for the obviousness of the life world. Folklore creation can remind us on the game Chinese whispers with a chain of people where one whispers a message to the next one, he to the next, and so on. There is only one crucial difference. Even in the, uh, if the output message can considerably differ from the input message, the output message must always make sense. Uh, if a meaning disappears, it is always replaced by another meaning, borrowed from collective mythologies in the sense of Roland Barthes. Something gets forgotten, something concealed or exaggerated. In this manner, communication society can make a mountain out of a molehill, and contrariwise. One belief makes possible another one in such a way that it functions as an assumption making similar assumptions passable and plausible. A believed and never falsified hoax makes people vulnerable against similar hoaxes and other genres, uh, genres of collective hysteria. A stated living folklore text must fit to the circumstances defined by current social and political needs but in the same time, it has the power to influence or even create these circumstances. People easily believe something if it corresponds with collectively shared images. Beside that, if we believe that other people believe something, 
it seems there must be at least something true on it. Let us be reminded on the sentence of sociologists uh, William Isaac <coughs> Thomas and Dorothy Thomas. If men define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. It means that collectively spread images can trigger social action in the form of very tangible deeds. We can find many examples from the, the pre-modern or even modern era which show that folklore creation can be responsible for violence, even for pogroms. Folklore can be something very dangerous. Folklore genres can also work as a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. If we draw on Berger and Luckmann, defamed and hated individuals can internalize the signs and images given them by the other people. They can fit to these signs and images. This way, society members can create what they believe. Collective fantasies can get real. Foucault created beliefs uh, also in modern society, although within relatively stable hierarchies of knowledge credibility. Nowadays, there disappeared the difference between consensually recognized credible and not credible information sources. The reproduction of credibility of modern knowledge institutions is disturbed to a large extent due to new communication technologies and due to neoliberal patterns of trading information. Contemporary production of knowledge functions beyond social hierarchies, beyond constraints of long-time authorities known from the era of modernity. The production of contemporary nationalisms happens to a large extent beyond the classical uh, ideological state apparatuses if we are to use the notion of Louis Althusser. The essential feature of new nationalisms consists in the fact that they are not embedded in former modern hierarchies of knowledge credibility anymore. Neoliberal knowledge institutions can reproduce their symbolic capitals and survive on the free market only in the way of permanent fighting for white audiences, in the way of entertaining, surprising, astonishing, amazing people. The only way a knowledge institution can prove reasons of its own existence is to make its spectators wonder. Long-term authorities have been, to a large extent, replaced by short-term authorities, movie stars and other celebrities as experts, bloggers, YouTube, YouTubers, etc. Which are characterized by no need to avoid contradictions and no need to maintain consistencies of knowledge. The flow of ephemeral newses do not need to be consistent anymore. Within the neoliberal media market, even the credibility of broadcasters is not necessarily a condition of their popularity, of their symbolic capital, and of their profits. Supremacy of rhetoric strategies in contemporary new media seems to be the answer to the question why neoliberal society does not reproduce the modern difference between noble and ignoble styles of communication anymore. Fooling and being fooled, disseminating ignorance and being ignorant does not seem to discredit anybody anymore. The slogan, anything goes, as a wish of 20th century postmodernists has become reality. Believing nonsense and speaking nonsense is not embarrassing for anybody anymore. Even the president of the most powerful country in the world uses bright bad news or info wars as legitimate information sources and pass them on to readers of his tweets. This is, of course, only one flagrant example of media folklore validation. If we are to consider notions like alternative facts or fake media as legitimate rhetoric tools of neoliberal state institutions, another new phenomenon appears. Western political institutions have started to use easily falseable fake information as well as mystifying accusations of disseminating fake information as legitimate tools of political competition. In this manner, neoliberal Western state has given up the attempt to reproduce credibility of its own institutions as well as the attempt to reproduce symbolical universes which would be able to unify different phenomena in integral and credible orders. No statement can make, can make somebody socially ostracized 
for a, long, for a longer time. Emotions break out and expire. What stays is the shift of red lines. Crossing red lines without any social consequences encourages other comparable subjects to do so. Under such conditions, it is quite easy to start to believe, for example, that refugees from Syria or Iraq are a perfectly organized body controlled and encouraged from a hidden center with one consequent long-time mission to make step by step the whole Europe Islamic in the sense of radical uh, political religion. Folklorized nationalisms are products of, so, of the so-called post-truth post society or post factische Zeitalter. Crucial for their emergence is the culture of uncertainty, of collective hysteria production, and its instrumentalization for short-time political and economical pur purposes. Neoliberal ideology as a sphere of cognitive and acting habitus means inter alia broad social acceptance for economically as well as politically motivated instrumentalization of people's feelings. The management of long-term consequences of such instrumentalizations, the responsibility for long-term damages is very often delegated to others. This is some kind of interpassivity in the sense of uh, Robert Fala or Slavoj Žižek. That's the responsibility for the long time consequences others should uh, solve this. I am now um, just, uh, just fighting for, for uh, my, my individual um, purposes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. And next on is Robert. Sorry, could I just ask, with the presentation, does the clicker work, or...? Mm. I think it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So Maybe the batteries are empty. empty. Yeah, probably. Mm. Okay, well... Just, sorry, just to make sure we can see it. Did we figure out how to make it full screen? F5. F5. Terrific. No. No. There's <laughs> always a technical issue. Always. Well, I'll start because actually I don't need a slide for about three minutes. Um, again, as, uh, I'd also like to thank everybody for well, the, the organisers for the invitation. Um, this is a little bit of an indulgence on my part, so I'm particularly grateful because this is actually a pilot study I'm presenting to you. And I have the, the tremendous luxury of being in a room of experts who might hopefully, I, I, I indulgently wish, give me some interesting feedback on really just a, a bit of a kind of tentative approach at the moment um, for a potential research project. Um, I think uh, I was delighted to be going on the first day to sort of get the stress out of the way, but actually, having heard the presentations, I now wish I were on the second because I would have made some modifications. There's a, there's a, there's a lovely link from our very first presentation this morning um, with the theme of decentering through the presentation we just heard um, about sort of hierarchies of knowledge to, to what I'm going to talk about, which is so called virtual new nationalisms, and that is how websites in particular use history to construct different kind of images of the nation in the present and to what end. So obviously it's an, it's an enormous question, there are very many ways to approach it, hence I've evolved a kind of particular methodology I'd like to talk to you about and share through the prism of four fairly brief given the time case studies. Um, now obviously the question of Neo again, as was raised by our distinguished keynote speaker, is important here, what do we need, mean by new? And I think now again, with the benefit of a sort of 45 minutes of reflection on that first speech, I realize now that my version of Neo is actually more about the method rather than the kind, so the form, not the content. So, so back to the old wine and new bottles question. I'm looking at websites, and that's the Neo-ness to me as a historian. It's websites as a historical source. How does that actually impinge on how we as historians, particularly using our methodologies, um, approach this knowledge, gain this knowledge, research them as sources? How do they fit within a wider taxonomy of historical sources is what interests me. And in that sense, I'm less interested in the media per se. I'm not interested perhaps in understanding the sociology of knowledge, but rather how these are historical sources. So a good example would be to talk about, say, for example, 60, the 16th century records of the French court, or even 19th century newspapers in Vienna. A historian wouldn't research um, the ownership of the newspapers in fine detail, or the reception of the, of the newspapers in fine detail. They would really just try and understand top line 
how the sources function, how bias might function within that matrix. They wouldn't go and, for example, with websites, you see where, where does one stop with the method? Does one start interviewing government agencies that are behind these websites? Does one conduct focus groups using sociologists uh, to understand reception? Again, drawing that line is very difficult. So I've done the following. I've applied to the content of selected websites, uh, just as it were, standard historical analysis of tropes, discourses, the kinds of the way in which history is used or abused, if you like, on the textual level, on the content level. But then I've applied something from the Oxford <coughs> Internet Institute, which is just a little bit, hopefully, of a way into understanding the mechanisms behind these websites. So-called internet research. So there are three component, main components to this, which are link analysis, and this allows us a sense of approximately how prominent the source is within the web sphere. So again, as we would understand the circulation of a 19th century Viennese newspaper to understand roughly how important it was, this allows us to say, well, how important is this website? Who links to it? Who does it link to? And so on. How reciprocal are these links? That gives us a, a, a vague sense of reciprocity. Um, that's also referral analysis. Who links to? Link analysis, who, who, uh, who you're linking from. Citation analysis. How often it's mentioned on things like blogs, social media. Again, just a little bit of a flavour of context there for the historical source. And finding change over time, obviously diachronics, very important for historians. How have they changed over time? And there's this wonderful tool, I don't know if you know it. It's also just interesting, full stop for anybody to use, is the Wayback Machine. So-called Wayback Machine, archive.org, where you can go type in a URL and it gives you historical snapshots of a website over time from its inception. So you can actually track change, tra again, using the kind of discourse analysis method, look at what they're actually saying and how it's changed over time. So in terms of the case studies I've selected, obviously one has to narrow one's approach, but again, hopefully using your own particular perspectives, you might see this as useful and who knows, perhaps we could even collaborate if that, if that emerges as something interesting. My case studies are parallel, so I wanted to do a kind of comparison between uses of history, abuses and uses of history in Poland today and in Germany today. Um, and what I chose was particular controversial and overlapping aspects of 20th century history. So again, that overlap is important because it makes the comparison a little bit more interesting and valid. So it's territorial losses. Poland's wholesale shift westward after 1945 and the so-called gaining of the recovered territories. How does Germany look at that now through selected websites? And in parallel, how does Poland look at the loss of former so-called Kresy to the east? Now obviously there are dozens and dozens of websites one can look at for this. I'm going to show you, show you just four. But the idea is to start and try to start creating a bit of a typology. Again, Svetlana Boyd was mentioned already once this morning. Her useful kind of categorization of types of nostalgia is one interesting way into this. So she makes a particular distinction between restorative nostalgia, so the idea that you don't just look at it with a kind of warm, fuzzy feeling. You want it back. You want to restore it in the present. Or reflective nostalgia, where you use it in a kind of melancholy, thoughtful way now. I do propose to break this down eventually, not in the course of today's very short paper, but just to show that, that, that it can be quite variegated, in fact, in the course of websites. So the first case study is uh, a Polish site about Lviv, so the city of the former Polish Lwów, uh, part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but for several centuries Polish before that, and still today with a large Polish minority. And this is the site Lwówcom.pl, but also Lwów.eu, first published in 2002 in this form, with the title The Wolf. Now, it looks pretty homemade. It has a single author. Again, a question of authorship is always very interesting on the internet. And again, that's back to the question of hierarchy and decentering. You can say you're somebody, but where's the, where's the, where's the kiachomka? Where's the stamp that says you are somebody? There isn't that, that necessarily. Link analysis solves that problem a little bit. How official is this? This is homemade. But over time, it has this kind of mixture of presentism, so content that's about contemporary polls in the wolf. Um, still living there now as Ukraine, but also this historical kind of, I call it the kind of chronicle. It's, it falls broadly within the ambit of reflective rather than the restorative nostalgia because there's no political program and because there's no statement of intentionality. The historical content sort of sits there as a catalogue or archive. Of course, the question of selectivity is always important. It is only really about Polishness in the North Lviv, backwards projected, but there's no statement that it should be Polish again. There's a bit of presentism. The presentism has been dialed down though over time. As you can see, the structure's exactly the same. There's a hell of a lot more content, but over time, this kind of archival um, maximalism has, has prevailed. 
But you can see on the left there, this is actually for a homemade site, it's very widely linked to official things such as Kuryev Galicijski, which is the Polish language newspaper for that, for Western Ukraine and the Polish minority, um, and various other websites. So, it, so again, I won't, I won't go into the detail, I have it if anyone's interested. Um, I mean, it also, again, in terms of presentism, it, this is the cataloging thing. Uh, there's, a, there's a kind of Lviv journal published in Warsaw. Its official archive is on this site. So again, for a homemade site, it has quite an official role. And the, the Polish theatre, which exists and still performs in Lviv uh, for the minority and by the minority, is also catalogued there. So there's this, like I say, there's this kind of balance between presentism and, uh, and past. But overall, this is not a political site. It's not, it, it, it issues any kind of political statements. It presents the information, again, supposedly neutrally. But again, we can question that. And again, as the, the, the case studies start to build, we can contextualize the picture a bit more. And, and I'll do that with another Polish site, which has a slightly different flavor. But moving on to Germany, um, sorry, I should also mention, yeah, academics use this site quite regularly. It's referred to as a kind of legitimate source among historians. Eleonora uh, Navrastelius, if anybody knows who writes a lot about the read, um, uses it. Now, in terms of memory politics in Poland today, we all know there's been a hardening of attitudes. Although, strangely enough, it seems to apply less where the Eastern policy still applies to Ukraine, to the so-called Crescent, than, of course, to Germany. Now, we all know that the reparations claim has been reactivated towards Germany recently. So what does, what does Germany think? Again, these, these are overlapping discourses. These are overlapping cases. What's the German attitude towards the so-called lost territories? Because, after all, Germany, ostensibly, would have a claim too. And the picture that emerges, again, there's only a couple of case studies here, but through various websites, is of a kind of rather ambivalent public discourse where, uh, as, the, as the author Andreas Kossert, who's a German writer with such titles as Kalte Heimat, or, um, and, uh, basically, basically uh, historical, wistful um, gatherings of reminiscences and analyses of the former Eastern territories, he calls it an ambivalence uh, based on emotional proximity but territorial and lived experience, distance in territory and lived, lived experience. After all, German minorities are much smaller than Polish ones in the so-called Crescent. So the attitude that emerges here is, is, is rather ambivalent in that way. Now, obviously, I didn't analyze, and this is another thing I could have done, explicitly far-right sites. In fact, I deliberately didn't. I wanted to understand the mainstream. And the site I'm about to show you is probably at the sort of far-right margin of the mainstream. This is der Deutsche Osten Interestingly, they don't really link to anybody except uh, a kind of uh, anti-child porno on the internet link. Uh, nobody links to them. And yet the site is very often updated. Um, you can see all the time they have little kind of polemical insertions which are dated. And their, their central argument is that these so-called Eastern territories were illegally taken from Germany. That there was a resolution from the Bundestag in 1950 saying that these are just temporary. Um, they quote this, they go back through aspects of, for example, Silesian history, we're in Silesia today, Lower Silesia, and say, for example, about Vesla, the city that we're in, uh, the city capitulated in 45, and with, on this date, the tragedy of Vesla began. Vesla. Ganz Schlesien, Niederlob Schlesien, ist und bleibt ein Teil Deutschlands. I don't need to translate that, I don't think. So you can see the agenda um, here. On the other end of the spectrum, again, just to sort of add, oh yes, the reason why this isn't far right, by the way, is because they very carefully say that they're not. <laughs> or at least, intentionality being the <laughs> thing. They make a very, a very careful point, they make, well, exactly, question mark, but they make a very careful point about slating the Nazi version of German history, for example, but again, it's a very conservative reading. One might also trace it back to certain uh, political tendencies pre-Hitler, the, the sort of greater German tendency, for example, with the way German language is written, that Hitler allegedly modernized the way of writing German and got rid of all these older German traditions. So again, they, this is a rather unusual piece, but it's not technically part of a political program in Germany. Ostpoisen.net uh, is more analogous with Le Wolf Compel in the sense that it's this kind of um, collection of links, a kind of a, a, a gentle, re reflective nostalgia cataloging all kinds of books about the region, uh, regional associations in Germany for people that used to live there. No ostensible program whatsoever, except when, go, when one goes back to, sorry, when, 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 go, when one goes back in the Wayback Machine to the original site, 
The statement was again a little similar to the Wolf Compare in terms of this is about reacquainting people with German history. Again, no political program ostensibly, but within that spectrum of ambivalence about German history and the kind of what's acceptable to talk about in the public sphere. Again, one recalls Erika Steinbach and the Bund der Vertrieben, and in Germany, this is part of German discourse, but it's somewhat on the margins of the mainstream. And for example, the bid to create a new museum for the Expellees in Germany, so in other words, validating German suffering, was not actually granted. So the discussion is still ongoing. But this kind of illustrates the, the, if you like, spectrum of the mainstream. And finally, the spectrum of the Polish discussion, on the other hand, is to kind of posit the so-called Kresy as present-day experience. This is a news, newspaper format, Kresy24.pl, uh, which looks like, I mean, okay, it's a historical kind of historicized visual, but it almost looks like kind of present-day present day newspaper with the news organized by parts of the so-called Kresy, and the news presented as though now, as though part of Poland, and guess what? It's actually sponsored by these people. So it's actually part of the Polish Senate. So this, you could argue, is part of official Polish memory politics. Now, again, there's no explicit program. There's no statement that these are part of Poland. But by implication, the presentation, selectivity, of course, being key to uh, how cultural memory, for example, is constructed in the paradigm of Jan Asman and others, selectivity is clearly key. And also how they present the information. Now, again, I'm so limited in time, I don't know time to go into it. Um, so concluding remarks really, I've, I've barely had time to sketch much, I had to show you a little bit in terms of detail, otherwise you wouldn't know what I'm trying to achieve. Um, but broadly speaking, I'd be interested in feedback on the methodology, how one actually understands as a historian what this is, as a, what these are as historical sources. I think they're important because, again, there's always been a shying away among historians from anything too contemporary, there's no critical distance naturally, but these, this demands the skills of the historian this is how history is being used and instrumentalized in the present, particularly reflecting on two controversial, this is why I picked it, two controversial and still relevant parts of national history that then are reflecting back on contemporary discourses. So the German sense of loss plugs into the IFD to some extent, but also certainly the discourse about whether it's, a, it's possible to talk about German suffering in World War II, that kind of rehabilitation. These sites are a kind of litmus test of that. And similarly, on the Polish side, there are litmus tests of discourses about recidivism and about the extent of loss, and to what extent actually that debate is really westward focused in Poland. It hasn't so much touched these territories yet. Let's see. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, at any rate, uh, an important part of the Romanian public sphere felt that the collective victims had been betrayed. Um, the collective disaster uh, obviously happened at a time when similar situations of crisis uh, were arising uh, in many other places. Um, and this, this uh, particular disaster was associated by the Romanian press with the terrorist attacks uh, at Club Bataclan, and Stade de France and a few other locations in Paris on, October, on November 13. Even though, of course, uh, those were terrorist attacks and what happened at Collective was an accident. However, given the fact that the, the accident was, this accident was related to uh, misgoverning in Romania, um, they were seen as, as being part uh, of, of, of things going wrong on the current political stage. Um, as the various countries uh, uh, have been uh, afflicted by various acts of terrorism, on the other hand, renewed waves of nationalism have made themselves acutely present on the global political stage, which again, um, uh, in Romania, was related to the collective fire. So my intention here is to analyze the interactions between the rhetorical constructions of the collective disaster in the Romanian print and online media, and the growth of a new rhetoric of nationalism that has accompanied the return to power of the Social Democratic Party in Romania. I will position my discussion in the context of the current rise of new waves of nationalism in Europe in a dialogue with Noemi Marin's work on the rhetorical constructions of post-communism and Bogdan Stefanescu's rhetorical approach to nationalist discourse in a comparative post-communist and post-colonial perspective. I would like to suggest that violent linguistic response to disaster can significantly alter existing public views on nationalism and national identity. Now, any discussion on, on, on nationalism in contemporary Romania has to be linked to what was going on under communism. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, as uh, George Schöpflin shows in uh, his forward to Walter Kemp's book on nationalism and communism in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, there is a basic contradiction in terms between communism and nationalism. So I quote from uh, Schöpflin, in simple terms, a communist cannot be a nationalist because the essential theoretical basis of these two answers to the problem of modernity contradict one another. Either one believes that culture determines consciousness, as nationalists do, or that economics does, uh, and this is a Marxist perspective. Uh, what communism did was to destroy all forms of identification other than communism uh, and the nation, unquote. Uh, communism internationalism, as Kemp shows in, in the respective book, clashed with the idea of nationhood, often punished by the system when it was identified as bourgeois nationalism. However, in Romania, uh, Nicolae Ceausescu built uh, his own combination of communism and nationalism uh, in total disregard of everything else that was going on in Eastern Europe because he wanted to build his own personal dictatorship and uh, uh, stay free from the Soviets. And in fact, uh, Western Europe admired, and, and, and the US admired him, um, at least at the beginning of his career, for daring uh, to confront the Soviets. Uh, however, um, the downside of, Romanians, uh, of Romania's independence was that uh, all this led to the formation of a nationalist ideology disguised as patriotism, which of course facilitated an anti-Soviet position, and the build, uh, but also the building of Ceausescu's own brand of totalitarianism. And as Bogdan Stefanescu stresses, one of the most harmful effects left behind by national communism in Romania was, uh, quote, to blatantly mystify and touch up Romanians, Romania's self-image, and also to ban alternative discourses, which could only develop uh, in exile. Uh, exile, in fact, was interesting because uh, uh, the, the, the intellectual discourse against communism, you know, so anti-communist resistance before 1989, uh, only developed outside the country with people like Joran Eliade, who can explain my um, in a way that is rather similar to what was going on before 1989, Romanian nationalism is connected to the political left rather than to the right at the moment. Romanian public intellectuals, most of them of liberal humanist convictions, are cautious in their use of a nationalist rhetoric, even in its more ethically constructive form of patriotism. Moreover, as Noe Marin shows, exiled public intellectuals like Jora and Eliade used exile as a significant rhetorical site for multiple investigations of public discourse. And I, I just quoted from 
marine. Uh, so uh, what happened was that you had to leave your country behind in order to develop nationalism, which, which again is contradictory because, well, uh, um, you should, I mean, basically, um, your intention is to uh, contribute to the development of your country. Um, thus, a sharp distinction is created between nationalism uh, as, a demo, as a demagogic discourse serving the self-promotion of a corrupt um, elite uh, of a communist background, patriotism uh, as a progressive discourse of freedom and associated with the ideals of a seemingly ongoing anti-communist revolution, and populism, which Stefanescu describes as one type of bad nationalism, which goes together with xenophobia, racism, jingoism, or chauvinism, um, a, uni a unidimensional uh, ideology responsible for ethnic and racial violence. Uh, 25 years after the fall of communism, nationalism in Romania, as in much of Eastern Europe, continues to be associated with the left. Through the Social Democratic Party and its current president, Liviu Dragnea, seen by the public opinion as the most direct continuator of Ceausescu's national communist doctrine in contemporary Romania. This kind of sensationalist version of nationalism, which basically works through manipulating people's emotions, continues to be a very effective and dangerous tool used in political self-promotion. And now to, the to, to this uh, interaction of nationalism and populism in the aftermath of uh, tragedy. Even though communism has long uh, been officially extinct, its structures of thinking and its propensity for corruption manifest themselves in the configuration of what Noemi Marin uh, calls the rhetorical space. Um, which she defines as an extension of Habermas's concept of public sphere. However, this concept changes Habermas's spatial metaphor into a discursive one, preparing the grounds for an argument about the importance of rhetoric in the construction of totalitarianism. In the rhetorical space of socialist Romania, in which Ceausescu's discourse was the only one that could be heard, um, uh, Basically, uh, the, uh, all reality was being reframed so as to serve the political purposes of the ones in power. Now, to come back to the immediate aftermath of the collective tragedy, the Romanian rhetorical space uh, uh, at that time, so precisely two years ago, was taken up by messages about the tragedy. However, their content was uh, very quickly distorted to serve the political struggles of the day. For the victims' families, what happened in Collective was not an accident, but the result of bad governing by the Social Democrats, perceived as neo-communist and corrupt. President Johannes himself, uh, who comes from a liberal background, uh, commented that people had to die for this resignation to take place, as he declared to, media, to the agency media facts. However, in the 2016 elections, the Social Democrats won the race for power once again, uh, an outcome that to many was as hard to, to understand as Brexit was. So it's kind of totally uh, strange uh, developments that, that run against people's uh, real interests. At various points in time, references to collective uh, have continued to be made to serve different, sometimes even opposite, political purposes. And what we see in the press um, is two types of nationalist discourses emerging after the collective tragedy and, and, and continuously making reference to what is going on at uh, Collective. Uh, one that was intended to be a patriotic discourse, represented by President Johannes mostly. We must do politics professionally in order to serve our country well, so uh, uh, Johannes appointed the government of technocrats right after the tragedy. The other discourse um, is a populist one, upheld by Liviu Dragnea, president of the Social Democratic Party, representing the Romanian left who aims to overthrow Johannes as not Romanian enough, he's an ethnic German, and to promote a sentimental approach to the needs of the people, which in fact masks a worrying amount of corruption. Uh, so it, it's meant to protect corruption, basically. Um, now, um, collective has become a symbol of the, struggle, of the struggle to do justice in Romania. Media companies such as MediaFax and ProTV uh, which are among the most progressive, took the personal dimension of the tragedy one level up by publishing online individualized pictures of the victims, showed in, uh, shown in happy, relaxed postures that contrast dramatically with the shocking details of their violent deaths. And this is only one example of how collective has been symbolically used to 
criticize uh, those in power. These pictures became emblematic of a victimized nation who, 25 years after the fall of communism, is still facing communist corruption. And the Facebook, uh, Facebook comments have uh, done a lot of work uh, in this respect. Uh, the anticlimactic the anticlimactic feel of the elections in November 2016, as compared to the genuine anti-corruption street protests that followed the club collective tragedy, led to further street protests outside the Romanian government headquarters in Victoria Square in uh, Bucharest in January and February 2017. Uh, this rise of a civic spirit that had been slow to form in Romania after the fall of communism corrected some of the abuses of the new government and seems to have been successful in warning them that such abuses could no longer pass unnoticed. The spirit of the post-collective demonstrations was invoked by the large masses who protested again against the new government's attempts to legalize certain forms of corruption in early 2017, showing that the public opinion had been prompted into an awareness that hadn't existed before. Uh, the memory of collective is still very present. Uh, in July 2017, according to Observador, um, uh, the death though, uh, rose to 65 as a young man took his own life uh, following his girlfriend's death in the collective tragedy and his disappointment with what was being done about that. So the collective legacy is still present and functions as, as, as a kind of symbolic Jiminy Cricket-like conscience reminder for the Romanian public uh, sphere. Uh, to conclude, uh, the ways in which an accident of disastrous consequences, such as the one caused by the fire in Club Collective in Bucharest on October 30, um, 2015, was used by each of the struggling political forces of the day to serve their own purposes. Uh, and this shows once again that the writing of history is a subjective endeavor, which significantly depends on the perspective of those in power, and which is fabricated through the use of rhetorical in the rhetorical space of recent Romania, personal and public messages built around this event took massive political proportions, but paradoxically ended up leaving behind the actual victims of the tragedy. Uh, how much we know or remember of any of the individual victims is relegated to the back burner as compared to the spectacular situation reversals that ensued uh, on the political stage. How much the Romanian government did for the collective survivors who are still in need of sophisticated medical care is another matter of concern. Such deviations of meaning expose one major flaw of populist discourses, despite their initial concern for the people, which often reaches high peaks of sentimentalism. Such discourses actually disguise much less generous political interests. As in the case of Ceausescu's own self-promoting populism, these days, Romanian nationalist discourses coming from the political left, disguised without much success, corrupted personal interests that have little to do with the people, their concerns, and even their tragedies. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Sabina. And um, um, well, we've had four quite rich and informative presentations. Uh, I also have to, uh, I would like to thank the, the, the presenters for uh, keeping uh, to the time limit. We have about half an hour for discussion, uh, even more than that, 35 minutes. Um, so, yes, please. So, I would also like to thank all five of you for interesting and very diverse presentations. You were very different. From PowerPoint to reading and presenting, and my question will be for Arthur and Simon. And by the way, I'm Uros from Victory, for those who still have that. So uh, my question goes to two of you, and it's if I understood you well, you have you made that opposition between subversive action and national conformity. And then this is a kind of a line, and you situated all of those details you have analyzed somewhere in between those two opposites. Possibilities. So uh, I've recently seen a movie, and I read a book before that, and the title is Yes, Did It Up. So where would you settle this kind of, I don't know, what the word would be the parody or satirical endeavor to, to, to present history? Shall we collect a few questions before we go? Well, we give the floor to participants. Uh, yes, well, Thomas is next. And then. Yes, uh, yes, well, thanks very much for 
very enlightening and interesting presentations. Uh, I mean, I have a comment first, which is about the nature of nationalism. I think we should be sort of wary of not using nationalism as a term of abuse. And uh, just to follow up a bit on what Miroslav Rolf said before the break, uh, there are different nationalisms and there are different sort of ways of belonging. And we should take care to distinguish between them. I mean, in European history, there are two main traditions. You know, you have the ethnic and you have the civic or the republican tradition, which are, which are quite different. Uh, they, they share some characteristics, but not all. One is based on ethnicity and the other is based on place. Uh, and that makes a, a huge difference in, at, a, in, at a time of mobility as to who is included and who is not, and, and the mechanisms of exclusion. So that's just one thing. And another thing that's, uh, that struck me when I listened to Maria Sabina was, uh, you, 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 you addressed it. But maybe we should also be a bit clearer about what this is, and namely the distinction between, you might say, what you could call nationalism from above and from below. You know, the state monitored, I mean, you, you, you addressed it. State monitored nationalism, uh, you should be faithful, you know, citizens, etc., and loyal, and so on, and the nationalism from above, which is often fueled by resentment against that very state. Right? So, uh, what I have in some of my earlier writings called formal and informal nationalism. So there are some of these distinctions that we might uh, want to, 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 to take along in order to be more accurate terminologically. That's, just, that's, that's just, just a thought. And then I have another question. I'm not sure to whom to address it, but this is very much about the relationship between the present and the past. Right? Uh, reviving the past. We spoke a bit about nostalgia earlier, and it's implicit, and to some extent explicit in some of your presentations. Uh, you know, uh, East Prussia. In, uh, so the question here is, if we think comparatively about identities, when was the past? Was it you know, last week? Was it the 1950s? In my country, it seems to be in the 1950s or 60s, when, when things were simpler, uh, when there weren't any black people in Norway, you know, when things were predictable. It was a bit boring, but it was safe. You had the Cold War and you had social democracy, and you had an idea of progress. But it was also the rural past, uh, the rural past of folk tales and of German romanticism, which had a huge impact in Norway. In Britain, it seems to me that one important past in Britain, correct me if I'm wrong, Rob, uh, is the, uh, the steam age, Victorian age. There's a huge nostalgia around steam engines and the uh, early industry and, and that sort of thing. So that's a, a, a crucial past. So it's really interesting to think comparatively about the past and what these implications of the different pasts are for the kind of presence they generate. I'm not sure if this was a question, but uh, just some mm -hmm. reflections after listening to these excellent presentations. Let's take one more, please. Uh, that question, I think, for each of the speakers, and for um, Arthur and Simon, that my, my question would be if you looked at um, examples of this Every Second Counts campaign that go at sub-national level, because there were some made about regions, some made about cities, and what this would say in terms of the role of satire in deconstructing the nationalism of Trump's America First thing. Um, to Jan, uh, I have a comment and a question actually. As a comment, you've, you've mentioned this, um, the example of refugees being organized as an army as an example of a post-truth society. But in the interwar period, and I semites would say the same about Jews, uh, that they are an organized army with a clear purpose to establish a Jewish state on the territories of Central Eastern European states. So, was that a post-truth society in the 30s, or uh, does this have to do more with perception of the others? And the other thing that I found very interesting in your presentation is this notion of a solidarity with Western Europe in responding to the refugee crisis. Because we often take it as a given that uh, a certain orientation towards Western Europe is always positive. That it's, it's sort of counter, countering nationalist narrative in Central and Eastern Europe. But this view of aligning oneself with the nationalist in Western Europe has always been again in the interwar and now of a certain nationalist discourse. So it's not that you know we were doing it against Europe, which is part of the narrative of course and against the European Union, but also we're aligning ourselves with nationalist movements in Western Europe who are doing the same. Now to 
They're left-wing uh, intellectuals who actually were trying to correct the regime that was going astray. So they, uh, they, they agreed with the doctrine, uh, which had its generous uh, aims and everything, but uh, uh, criticized corruption. In Romania, however, uh, I, my, my, my immediate interpretation is, but of course it's not as simple as that, uh, but the, 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 the intellectual's reaction was that uh, uh, since uh, uh, Ceausescu was so radically corrupt and totalitarian, everything that was connected to communism was going to lead to that, so we had to reject communism altogether. However, Ceausescu's dictatorship was, of course, based on communism, but was not communist, was something else, was totalitarian. Uh, that's, where, that's where my problem is, as yeah. you find this left wing communist. I know, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. that is very awesome. Yeah, <laughs> that's weird. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, are you done answering all the questions? Because since since you took the floor, then Sorry. it's yours. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, then let's let's move in this direction. And okay. Robert first. Uh, well, thank next. you um, very much for the questions. I'll perhaps start with the, to me, slightly easier one, which is how I select my cases. And thank you for the comments. Um, again, this comes down a little bit to hierarchy because, again, bearing in mind that we are historians and, and, and what we're trying to understand is, I suppose, to some extent, the prominence of things in the public sphere its prominence that I'm looking for. So how interlinked they are is one methodology I mentioned. Um, another one is, actually, I didn't mention this at all, but Google and Google Analytics, how, how prominent things are in the search rankings gives you a very good indication. And the, the, the strongest example of this was der Deutsche Osten.de, which you would think is pretty extreme within the mainstream. It's top in the Google search rankings. So that's pretty, uh, but of course your question is excellent because how does, what, where does one draw the line? I think where I drew the line was to, 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 to try and choose very limited historical cases and case studies so that these are very much only about these lost territories. And of course, even within that, there are a lot of websites. But then when you start to add other um, kind of filters like um, internet analysis, internet research methodologies, uh, Google ranking, interlinking, and so on, then it starts to get a bit narrow. But you're right, it's a problem and it's a question. Which brings me on to... Uh, the first question, well, it was a, you phrased it as a comment, but I hopefully have a bit of an answer, at least it's one that works for me, which is to use, the, in terms of when is the past, the one I tend to use is the methodology of cultural memory. So I mentioned it very briefly and in passing. So again, there are other historians in the room who may disagree or have other approaches. I find it very useful in terms of understanding the instrumentalization of the past at a given moment. So it's a question of where you stand, obviously. So in terms of today, we look at how it's, again, it's a top-down question, so how it's constructed through things like uh, memorial policy, school textbooks, and so on. That's the traditional way of doing it. And of course, naturally, there are these longer-term markers. In Britain, it would be 1066, is always remembered, and yes. regurgitated ad nauseam. Of course, the empire, but not told as empire, because it paints us in a bad light, but told as the Industrial Revolution, the achievements of Victoria, Brunel, and so on. So yes, there are these, mark these temporal markers which are set down in 
and you can read them, if you like, through school textbooks, memorial policy. Again, if you look at memorials in London, they're nearly all to the great industrial age. Uh, well, obviously later, later then, of course, different periods, but, but a lot of them focus on that. Um, there was another point, so I've lost my notes. Yes, but then that's exactly where, it, where websites become interesting, and again, because they break apart that hierarchy or taxonomy within cultural memory, which makes a relatively rigid distinction, because I guess it was evolved before the internet, between top and bottom, oral history on the one hand, and a codified public history on the other. Where do they sit? They're somewhere in between. What's the agency in these? And again, part of my fear with this project is, do I then have to go and start digging into things like who is running these websites? What are government agencies saying about it? You get into some quite murky water, maybe into Putin's little green men sitting in Petersburg, <laughs> uh, manipulating it, who knows? But then you see, it, it, it becomes quite a difficult topic. So I'd be interested perhaps in the corridors afterwards to talk to people about where the line is drawn for a historian, because I per personally don't necessarily want to go there. Um, but, but only in the corridors, because Putin's little green men are listening. Well, course. exactly. <laughs> Phones off. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Simon and Arthur? Yeah. Thank you for the questions. Um, I start with your question. Um, there is no subnational level in those um, videos. And there's also no supranational level like the European Union. Um, so this is also a. They've done one about post prison, they've done one about the city where I'm based. Many cities have actually done it. Uh, America first. If okay, to right. Do it, there there are. There other are. cities have done it too. <laughs> So they've, yes. they've, they've died as a mockery of the regional and, and town level as well. Right? Okay. Those are, you, should, you should check them out if you haven't. It's, um, it's really interesting. I've checked those videos also. There's okay. maybe a Bavarian video. Uh, yeah. but what I meant is... Um, uh, in the videos from the um, Neo Magazine Royale and uh, other late night shows that focus on nations, in those videos uh, there is no sub-national level and no supranational level. But yes, you're right. Uh, there are also... Um, videos from nations that are not collected in the um, website everysecondcounts.eu. So um, it's, it's also um, in YouTube you all find uh, a lot of videos uh, uh, calling themselves uh, official. And you never know, well, from who is the, the authority uh, who uh, makes this video officially? <laughs> um, and. Um, the two, there are two videos from Poland, for example, and both call themselves official. Um, so you have n at least um, at the end no idea um, what is uh, true and not, and who are the authors of the videos. It's, it's uh, a bit confusing. Um, yeah, but th those videos um, mainly uh, focus, focus national identities and national uh, make national self representations um, and it depends on it depends on um, they try to build a new self uh, national self representation um, that is that counter right wing national self representation but it is still a national self representation this is the problem in, um, in um, yeah, at these videos. And um, there's another, another example. Um, in Germany, they, um, in 2015, Angela Merkel um, let in uh, 150,000 uh, refugees, um, mainly Syrian refugees, uh, from the train station in Budapest to Munich train station. And there have been a lot of volunteers um, helped those refugees. And then the media wrote that there is a welcome culture in Germany. And everybody has, um, uh, thought that um, it's a great nation that is welcoming refugees. So uh, this is also an example for uh, positive national self-representation, um, which is against the right-wing national self-representation. So there are yeah, two sides of uh, one, uh, uh, one coin. coin, thanks. Uh, there are both two sides of one coin. And um, so when we talk about new nationalism, uh, new, national, new nationalism is based on something. It's based on nationalism. Um, also, the conservative parties, uh, for example, in Germany, um, have extremely nationalist opinions in some ways. 
And uh, so the election for the alternative for Germany yesterday uh, was based on, on concepts that are in a common sense in uh, maybe all European, maybe all Western, maybe every country in the world, a common sense of uh, nationality. Okay. Yes, um, I would like to answer the first question, <laughs> which is not easy because I didn't see the movie. I didn't see it, and so I cannot say anything uh, very specific about it. But I know that there was a controversy when it was aired, when it first uh, came out, and the controversy uh, uh, was like this, can we make fun of, such a, of something like that? Is it allowed? Is it morally okay? Is it, does it lead to anything not intended by the makers and everything that follows? Um, I would, so I, I don't know how, where to put it exactly, but perhaps I can say something about the distinction between uh, that you, that you uh, mentioned that we are, were <coughs> trying to make. Um, where does this come from? I want to give you an example from my personal life. I uh, experienced that when you have a little child and it is confronted with such things, images, in, like na nationalist images and nationalist um, uh, encounters for the first time, how do you react? How do you explain, how do you help that child to deal with it? In what way? To somehow understand what's going on, and that's what I meant with understanding. Um, uh, this, the, the slide, I understand. If I didn't, I couldn't oppose it. But what do we understand, and how do we understand? And in this context that uh, also uh, Mr. Kaifosh or Jan uh, talked about this very, very um, emotional um, charged uh, uh, communication that is uh, that, that you can see everywhere right now it does not really allow a deep understanding it allows a very spontaneous as you say aestheticized I, I find that very very uh, very good uh, um, um, uh, words <laughs> to use in that context very useful helpful um, and how do you get to a deeper understanding how do you do that without without uh, always having to uh, be the one that leaves fun out and everything is not allowed and I'm oppressing everything fine and relieving and whatever. And that is a very, very uh, tough thing to do, but I think it is a, a something that has to be done over and over again. And it's not easy. The, uh, the arguments of right-wingers are easy to get along with. You can just jump emotionally right into them and wow, everything is clear. The other way is hard, you have to dig. <coughs> okay, before I give the floor to Jan, let me have a short follow up on this solidarity question because what I see there as a Russian studies person is no, is no solidarity at all, it's actually superiority. Because what is being constructed in this discourse is uh, uh, the true Europe, as Ivo Neumann put it in his uh, 1996 study of Russia, which has been recently republished. Uh, this image of uh, our country being truly European and those Germans, those poor Germans are suffering under all, all those migrants. So you might want to rephrase it a little bit, but I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe you know, if you look at the, at the actual discourse, it's different compared to uh, say the Russian example, so please. Uh, okay, I would just like to answer the question if I compare the present and the past, because that, that was the, the point, as, as I suppose. Um, it is not uh, actually a comparison between the present and the past. My point at the departure was the book of uh, Peter Berger and uh, Thomas Luckmann, Social Construction of Reality, and this, uh, they described uh, you know, the, the situation uh, actually in Europe in, in the 60s, um, anyway, after the Second World War. 
And I just tried to compare, you know, the, uh, the content of the book with the situation today, with the situation nowadays. I, I, and I tried to point, uh, point out what doesn't fit to, to the reality to, to today. So um, if I say uh, that there is something new in the world of modernity, uh, that, uh, there uh, functioned or, the, or worked the hierarchies of knowledge. There was something was noble, something was ignoble. Uh, you could just uh, 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 laugh uh, about uh, uh, some, um, some um, contents or expressions which you, uh, which you recognized as a part of, of folk creation. But today, uh, you know, today if the folklore, in the sense, um, in the meaning what, what I use, uh, uh, we have also in the White House, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, everything is uh, uh, everything is noble. Do you understand that the, the hierarchies of knowledge disappeared, and that is uh, the point? Or oh, nothing is noble. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. Right. Um, thank you. So can I go to me a couple? Um, I'll start with you though, because um, I find that what you did was important to our uh, discipline. And I need to talk about rhetoric and the importance of rhetoric and the importance of discourse in analyzing all these political and uh, social phenomena. And I think it's great. And one of the things that I liked was that you mentioned demagogic discourse. And I think this is a category that we're not using enough. Because we are used to um, talking about differences in politicians platforms in terms of the values they have held, the uphold or the, uh, their action and the impact of their action, measurable impact of their action, you know, real stuff. But um, what, if, what about their behavior when you look at populism, for instance? You know, how, how do you factor that in? Which is the uh, discipline that will help you do that? Um, but in any case, I'm going to use this term to
Is it a brief comment or a question? Uh, well, then it has to wait. Uh, we have two more, so you, you go first, then uh, the yes. Yeah, yes. Dorota, and then yes, other. Okay, so a few remarks, which also remarks on the questions, and to the, and to the point as well as to the questions. First of all, um, it's a very important question, I think, here in the context that Chris um, Eriksson asked about when is the past. Uh, is, uh, like, uh, what would you say about this, that in uh, some kind of discourses, but especially nationalism, I think we have a lot about but it's important to remember because um, these websites um, present, or your websites, present some kind of presentism mm -hmm. in thinking about um, culture, which also includes the past. And this present is made forever, but this past story is made forever alive in the present. Um, like, for example, <laughs> some of those web websites um, are strongly revolutionary. Uh, and very kind of coy about it. Uh, like um, a, a website by this um, organization Center for Today is like oh, yes. across That's the one of the case studies. Yeah. 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 organization going to ball yeah. <laughs> that is not going to be from the as to their territory. Um, so this I think is important to um, bear in mind investigating the websites of whatever kind. And related uh, to Simon and Alta and, and your, um, um, I think it's it's not possible to program. I mean, what should be done with these stereotypes? Because I mean, these stereotypes are deconstructed. But you uh, you were um, I don't know if I got you uh, in the right way, but you spoke about emancipation as an effect of this deconstructed presentation of all the presentation of the stereotypes. And you know, but who is? Are going to be emancipated. Uh, this I would like to ask you, and I think programming, like how do you make those um, this deconstruction more obvious? Is going to work? Because then the irony wouldn't be so biting. I think it was like back in the nineties that Zizek uh, wrote this piece on the exchange of stereotypes, offensive stereotypes and obscenities between conflicted 
and men, uh, between members of conflicting nations as very liberating and uh, peace bringing sometimes. But it has to be always on the individual level. So maybe uh, these websites have um, may have this kind of an effect, you know, an exchange of uh, offensive things uh, into ceremonial uh, inverted commas. And briefly about the uh, folklore, <coughs> uh, I think this folklorization and the folkloric aspect of, uh, uh, let's say, I mean, not only nationalist thinking, but various cultural productions in the present the popular ones, including the website and so on, um, has a, I mean, provides a very pliable material for, uh, politi for political discourse, political actions. Yeah? And uh, one very recent example from Poland um, that is not so political, apparently, uh, uh, which is um, the mobilization of anti vaccination movement. Yeah? Very populistic, typical, yeah? popular kind of, um, and uh, uh, inscribing to this problem of not believing the experts and so on, and became political. Yeah? Our Prime Minister says, I want to cater to the needs of those people. And to uh, Sabina's uh, problem with um, the paradox of the leftist being uh, nationalist, etc. I think this is, I mean, the quote definitely was uh, out of context. I mean, the, 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 the chapter that he quoted is simply wrong and because he was not contextualizing. And second, um, if you frame it within the idea of post ideology and post politics, it's just pragmatic. Um, whatever is left and right, etc. Um, that's why it's so easy to be so hybrid, yeah? because it's uh, not ideology anymore, but management of sentiment, of effect, really. That is at stake. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Professor Hoff. Uh, no, sorry, we don't have time for any more questions. One minute each who goes over that stays without lunch. So, Jan, <laughs> <you're> first. <laughs> to the question of nationalism, I would say when, uh, when I uh, check the websites and uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, internet memes and so on, that uh, the, uh, the neighbor state is not anymore an issue. For example, borderlands uh, like Silesia. Silesia it, it is not a question, or even uh, Eastern Russia. It's, uh, uh, I am speaking now about popular cu culture. But what is the question are the refugees or the strangers among us? So uh, this is some kind of shift what uh, on uh, that uh, we can uh, on on the base of that we could speak about uh, about new nationalisms besides other questions and now about the refrainment what is new uh, uh, if somebody of uh, some of you maybe know uh, alfred schütz the uh, strukturen der lebenswelt yeah uh, he says there that the everyday knowledge is full of paradoxes yes the um, the um, uh, 
scientific. the scientific knowledge uh, uh, is um, uh, uh, is trying to be uh, to be uh, some kind consequent and uh, not not contain paradoxes. But what I mean through folklorization is the possibility uh, to uh, to mix uh, everything. So in five. Uh, uh, now you can uh, you can have compassion for refugees, and in five minutes uh, uh, you you can say we have to uh, um, we have to um, ex ex expel them, expel them. Yes. So so you can uh, you can maintain uh, actually everything everything everywhere, and that is the new that the uh, the, the consequence is not anymore uh, needed. Um, perhaps on the question of emancipation, who should be emancipated from what or whatever. Um, first of all, I want to say I think we've been gotten a little bit wrong. We didn't want to say those videos are not like good or uh, <laughs> progressive. We wanted to say they are both. Yeah? And emancipation is, at least for me, in my opinion, this distance from which we can, well, every critique needs this distance. So. And emancipation is uh, the result of some critique, as I think, yeah? of a critical pr pr process. And um, even satiric or, or uh, um, sarcastic videos like these, I think the uh, distance to these videos that allows critique is very important because otherwise they would function the same way as we are, are speaking right now of these um, right-wing or nationalist or whatever uh, input in the media. Like emotionally very, very cheap to have, very, very uh, 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 yeah, fast functioning, but it's not deeply understood. It's not critic criticized from a distance and not really understood. So the change is very superficial and it can be, it's not stable. That's what I want to say. I, I think it didn't come out. Yeah. Okay, and um, as uh, Stuart Hall said, um, a message is never or seldom um, interpreted as it is intended. So, um, of course, uh, the videos are interpreted in a very different ways. Uh, and this would be very interesting to analyze uh, the recipation of um, the videos, but this is uh, hardly possible. Um, as, um, maybe it is a possible uh, if you analyze the comments uh, under the YouTube videos. And uh, we uh, looked at the comments um, at the, from the Polish uh, video contributions from Poland, and it is quite interesting because um, uh, the users can like comments, and the most liked comment uh, was "Long live for long live for Poland." Uh, it's a live, not life. Long live for Poland. Greeting from Hungary. And then there is a, um, a sentence in um, Hungarian, and um, God bless Google Translator. Uh, it <laughs> means this was a serious video. So. Um, this is very interesting that uh, it may be intended as a set satire video, but it was uh, understood as serious, seriously, as a serious video. Um, unless the comment was ironic. Mm. Unless, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, no smiling. But it is not. It is not. It is not ironic. Um, and the title of this video is um, Remember Poland is and always will be number one. So maybe this video also mm -hmm. was not meant ironic. Um, okay. Yeah, and uh, you're absolutely right, right? We have to make it uh, clearer what uh, is the difference between irony and satiric and uh, sarcasm. Thanks for that. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, as it sounds like so, so obvious, but the answer depends slightly on the question. And I think in terms of the past always being present, 
it definitely is in my cases because my question is about uses of the past. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of here by proxy because I think it's useful for potentially inserting the lens of neo-nationalism, but that's not really my focus. I'm interested in general in uses of the past, some of which can be subcategorized as so-called neo-nationalism. So in a sense, my, my question biases the answer towards uses of the, the present. But actually what then becomes interesting is reception, to, to your point slightly. And actually these websites become something of a kind of reflecting mirror of the bias of the, the receivers. So if cultural memory is, is, a, is, as I say very often, legible and codified from the top down, and in a sense even though these websites break apart that hierarchy, they're codifying something, and they could be read as historians as conforming to this or that narrative of national identity, as the professor said earlier, potentially civic or or, or ethnic, and in the Polish case, there's this very clear distinction between, if you like, the Piłsudski tradition, which is multi-ethnic and so on, and, and kind of Rzeczpospolita versus Domowski, which is blood and, and, and church, in theory. But then in practice, these people take it and run with it according to their bias. So an example of Lwów Kompel, which, as I say, I think is fairly clearly this kind of um, reflective nostalgia, just a sense of grasping onto as many facts about the past as possible, not overlaying it, lay, lay, laying it with any interpretation. Nevertheless, people have taken it, and in some of the, 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 the blog mentions I've read of it, it's things like Lwów jest Polski, Lwów is Polish, and quite some quite strong statements. So, again, that's two, there's two separate spheres there. There's, there's intention, and then there's, there's, there's effect and reception. And, and again, of course, that's where I find it interesting, because we can plot these responses on the spectrum in terms of, again, in terms of what we mean by nation nationalist and what we mean by, or maybe we see it as patriotic, maybe we see it as nationalist. And then there's a spectrum between how these sites do it and then how they're responded to. Yeah. Uh, many thanks to uh, uh, Bogdan and Dorota for, for uh, their comments and to Professor Eriksson actually for the earlier comment on nationalism from above and below. Uh, and to link this to, to Bogdan's comment on uh, dem demagogic discourse, which is actually a, a discourse a lot of politicians, if not all of them, employ when they want to promote themselves. Yeah, they make use of false prejudices and, uh, and popular prejudice and, and make false uh, 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 promises uh, in order to uh, get themselves uh, elected, and then they usually never uh, comply with those. I think in the construct, in in in. in Build, uh, building a link between uh, these two types of nationalism, Professor Erickson was mentioning, uh, demagogic discourse plays a very important part because actually a lot of politicians who are trying to dominate the masses uh, uh, kind of uh, extract uh, all sorts of uh, uh, beliefs the masses have and try to work with those in order to, uh, to build uh, a, a domineering discourse which is then never carried out practice when, when they become elected. As for Shuplin's decontextualization uh, of um, um, this, uh, this um, uh, uh, contradiction between communism and nationalism, I, I, I do agree that, uh, of course, he speaks theoretically. Uh, so he addresses a, a, a kind of theoretical, uh, ideal construction of communism, which was never uh, put in practice. On the contrary, communism in all its uh, 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 concrete manifestations ended up in all sorts of totalitarian um, uh, rules. But then I think, I mean, uh, what drew my attention uh, in Schöpflin's comment was that we might be able to use this precisely in order to address the question why communism never worked. Maybe it actually, uh, I mean, of course, there are lots of theories on that, but then isn't, isn't uh, isn't this contradiction between its uh, very generous purposes, uh, its very generous theoretical purposes, okay, this kind of egalitarian um, world that we're trying to build and everybody's supposed to, 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 to have their needs attended to, which was never, never done. Uh, isn't, isn't that an issue that has something to do with a mismanagement of, of, of nationalist discourse and national ideals actually in the communist approach. So I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think that's what the conference is doing, yeah. It's been a great panel. If you agree, please join me in thanking the presenters. <laughs> Thank you very much.
nothing to eat. <laughs> <laughs>